Hello everyone. Welcome to Labor Economics. This is Chapter 1, Introduction to Labor Economics. And my name is Dr. Gerek. I am your economics professor. Let's get started. So in part one, we will be covering why study labor economics. We'll also talk about basics of the labor market. Okay, so we're going to touch base on these two things. Let's get started. Observations always involve theory. This is Edwin Hubble. If you heard about it, Hubble telescope. Um, and um, I want you to underline one thing. Observations, these are more empirical observations, right? But it, it has basis on the theory. So in this class, we're going to talk a lot of, uh, about economic theory. And also we'll be covering labor economics theory starting this chapter a little bit, but really starting with chapter two. So let's get started. Why well, study labor economics, AKA, am I wasting my time here? Absolutely not. One third of your time, eight hours a day, you spend sleeping. Okay, that's why they tell you pick a really good bed mattress. Also, workday is eight hours of your life, if not more, right? So we spend a lot of time in labor markets, okay? So labor economics studies how labor markets work. So this course will help us understand and address many social economic problems facing modern societies. So in this course, we'll be learning about labor supply, labor demand. We'll be learning about labor market discrimination. We'll be learning about immigration across different labor markets. We'll learn about human capital, which is a subset of it is education, formal education and many more topics in this course. You will really enjoy it. I love teaching it. This is my specialty. So let's talk about some of the policy issues labor economists study. So I am by training a labor economist, by the way. So let's take a look at the labor force participation rate for men or and women, okay? So labor force participation rate, labor force participation rate we are going to talk about this in the future chapters however it is the percentage of population population that is either employed or unemployed so i apologize for the clicking sound i'm having trouble with my tablet just uh, i'm doing everything with a mouse so just for the current chapter, sorry about that. Okay, so let's take a look at the labor force participation rate for men and women. So this is since 1960s, labor force participation rate, you know, percentage of population that participates in the labor. Okay, so if you look here, I'm going to go back later. Okay, so if you look at 1960s, so this, this one is the male men in the United States. Oops, there is a ni not a very nice dip there. And this is women's labor force participation rate. General trend is that women's labor force participation rate has been trending up, while male labor force participation rate has been trending down. If you look at 1960s, Male labor force participation was around 85%. Female was 38 only. So that's, that's a huge gap, right? 85, 38. Okay. So these gray shaded areas are the economic recessions. Recessions are when the GDP gross domestic product of the country goes down consecutive quarters okay so here we had another quick recession due to uh, the pandemic right and there's a huge dip here because this recessionary period actually affected our ability to work and uh, it limited our chances of um, caring for our families so children out of school so people dropped out of labor force really really in a um, huge rate 
Okay, so, but whenever you see recessionary period, labor force participation rate tends to go down in those periods. Even though it's going up, it kind of stabilizes down, stabilization down. Here you have it going down, okay? Another one is if you look at 2000s, the labor force participation rate for men is about 75%, for women is 60%. So as you can see from 38 to 60, that's a huge development, 85 to 75 decline. So we'll talk about the reasons behind women's increased labor force participation rate in the future, okay? So then today, this is, these are, recent values this is december 2022 values okay 68.1 percent for male and 56.8 percent for women okay so what are the reasons behind this what's going on so this is one of the questions labor economics explains okay next one what if 125,000 people move to your town in six months months what 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 would happen so the university our university is at corpus christi corpus christi is a, has about three hundred fifty thousand people can you imagine if these many people moved into our town housing scarcity right shortage jobs unemployment would go up this actually happened to miami in 1980s um this happened in april 21st of 1980 when mass exodus of Cubans who departed Cuba, Cuba's Merrill Harbor for the U.S. as political, they were seeking political asylum. How about minimum wages? So labor economics helps us understand minimum wages. I'm actually going to go to an external web page. So if you click on this link, folks, I just clicked on this link. You're going to go here. Okay, so this is the DOL, Department of Labor, Government, United States, a state minimum wage law. So in the United States, minimum wages is minimum wage, the federal minimum wage is 725. This is updated January 2023, January 1st. Some states can actually go above it. They can offer more. For instance, California offers $15.50, okay, minimum wage. Washington, Washington offers 15.74. These are two of the highest ones. However, for instance, Texas, Texas is at the federal level, 725, and lots of other, lots of other states follow that. So this map shows you states with higher than minimum wage than federal higher than 725 these states nevada washington oregon california arizona new mexico colorado south dakotas minnesota missouri arkansas you have of course new york too these are a little bit more expensive states new jersey New York and so on and so forth and we have other states with the same minimum wage as federal all these states okay so if there's no minimum wage as stated then you have to comply with the state okay so going back so what happens if minimum wage let's say goes down to one dollar what happens if the minimum wage goes up to twenty dollars per person entire united states we can uh, analyze and answer these questions with the tools of labor economics and another question we might be able to answer these are just examples by the way occupational safety what's the impact of occupational safety and health regulations we call them osha on employment and earnings so what if you know we didn't translate some workplace instructions to spanish we are in Texas. We have lots of Spanish fluent people working. What if those translations weren't available? What if we weren't taxing workers' earnings and payroll? Okay. 
So how about if we didn't have government intervention and workplace safety? Okay, so all these are discussed in this class. So next we will talk about the basics of the labor market. So all the participants have motives. We have workers. I'm a worker. I'm a professor, yes, but I'm a worker. I'm the laborer producing this class, right? Workers seek for the best job. Firms, companies, the university is a, we are not a for-profit institution. We are an educational government institution. However, in general, firms are trying to maximize their profits. So again, even if it's a non-profit, that doesn't mean we are not seeking to make profits because you don't want to be losing money. Let's say you are a non-profit, you have mission, but if you lose lots of money, that mission will be lost within a couple of years because you'll be out of the business, okay? And the third agent participant is government. Government uses regulations such as OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health Regulations, uses regulation to achieve goals of public policy. For instance, minimum wages, for instance, occupational safety, okay? So let's focus on these three actors a little bit more carefully. Number one, workers. This is the most important factor of uh, factor and actor in labor markets because if you have no workers, there's no labor. They try to maximize their utility. Utility in economics, you remember from principles classes, defined as... The satisfaction we get when we consume goods and services. So you're trying to maximize your utility. Uh, you're trying to maximize your leisure. You, however, with each hour of work, you make money so you can buy consumption goods. Okay. So workers try to optimize by selecting the best choices among the available ones. Okay. So I'm trying to, for instance, as a worker, I optimize my utility by choosing the hours of work. Let's say I'm paid, I'm not paid by hour, but I'm paid by hour. Uh, let's say my hourly payment goes up from $25 to 50 bucks, right? I'm going to try to take advantage of this, but there's a sweet spot. For instance, I won't be working 100 hours, okay? We'll talk about that in the labor supply. And workers supply time and effort for higher payoffs, wages, salaries. So this causes an upward sloping labor supply curve. So if you look at this, this is labor, number of hours. It could be number of workers. On the y-axis, this is wages, wages. So labor supply curve, I'm going to put LS, labor supply curve is upward sloping. The wages go up, I'm going to supply more labor. So keep this in mind. Firms, firms make the hiring and firing decision. So I'm going to actually <laughs> carry this labor. I'm going to carry this labor supply curve here because as you probably guessed, we're going to add labor supply. We're going to add labor demand. Firms make hiring and firing decisions. They are trying to maximize their profits. So relationship between the price of labor, right, wages, this is wages, and the number of workers a firm is willing to hire generates the labor demand curve. So the higher the wages, the fewer workers I would like to hire, lower the wages in this region, I want to hire a larger quantity of workers. So there you go. Labor demand curve is by... This is by firms. So it's a little different, right? In consumer markets, demanders are customers. In labor markets, demanders are firms. Suppliers are workers. Okay. So labor demand curve, this is something you need to know, is also called a derived demand curve. Derived demand curve means... I will demand, I will have demand for labor if there is demand for my product. So if there is a consumer demand for whatever I'm producing, let's say this Stanley cup, I had to grab my water cup, new year, new me, 
resolution. Drink water, right? So let's say I'm the producer of Stanley Cup. If nobody wants this cup, right? Then I'm not going to hire anyone. That's why my demand for labor is called derived demand. It comes from the consumer demand. Okay, know this. This is going to come in um, tests and quizzes probably. Government imposes taxes and on workers and firms and regulations. So we have, for instance, tax, uh, social security ta tax, so that when workers retire, they have funds to fund their retirement. And OSHA regulations. Government provides ground rules that guide exchanges made in labor markets. Okay, so you have workers, firms, for instance, where would government, you know, if there is no government, labor supply demand curves intersect, right? Wages and number of workers, right? Market clears. This is the equilibrium wage, equilibrium quant of labor. But what if government imposes a minimum wage? What if government posts a minimum wage? Okay, so basically says that you cannot charge less than, let's say, minimum you can charge less than 725 which needs to be about the equilibrium so this is the minimum wage. what this does is it actually changes your labor supply curve so your labor supply curve becomes this squiggly curve straight here and then goes up so the new Labor demand didn't change. This is the same labor demand. Intersection of these two will be here. So the number of people employed will be, with the minimum wage, will be much less. So you will have unemployment, right? And then wage rate is going to go up. All right. So this concludes part one. In part two, we'll cover why use economic theory. And we'll also talk about positive and normative economics.